Um, this week we are covering chapter 8 in the textbook. So um, this chapter is going to cover physical growth, maturation, and aging. You will remember that these are three terms that we said were related to the topic of motor development, but weren't quite synonymous with motor development. Oftentimes people will um, use growth, maturation, and aging in place of development, but remember that development is a continuous process, and each of these things typically happens at a specific time point within the lifespan. So that's why uh, we can't use them interchangeably. But uh, we're going to go each of these, or we're going to go over each of these a little bit more in depth than we did when we skimmed over things um, during the first week. So hopefully um, you'll get some more insight to some cool stuff. Uh, let's go over physical growth first. Um, and for each of these, we're going to go through um, lifespan changes. Um, but growth, remember, is influenced by uh, genetic and extrinsic factors. So when we think of growth, we think of an increase um, or also a decrease in uh, physical qualities. So oftentimes we say growth is mostly associated with height and weight. Um, and that's pretty much what we're going to be focusing on for the most part in this section. But um, the genetic factors we know, you know, like if you have tall parents usually, or a tall parent, sometimes it only takes one, right? Um, but usually if you have tall parents, you end up with a tall kid, unless they get a recessive gene. <laughs> you have tall, tall parents, but a really short kid. In my case, I'm just short, so... <laughs> Um, neither of my parents are super tall. They're pretty average height. But anyway, I was I was never supposed to be over five feet. So I'm five four plus. That um, growth spurt finally kicked in. <laughs> um, but we also have extrinsic factors that can affect growth patterns. Um, usually, extrinsic factors are going to play a larger role later. Um, in the lifespan, but we will talk about prenatal development and some extrinsic factors that can affect growth before a person is born. So um, extrinsic factors are just anything external to the body. Patterns in growth and aging kind of follow the concept of universality. So in general, we see um, kind of typical growth patterns. Uh, throughout the lifespan, but remember that we also have a concept of variability and individuality where uh, some individuals may have uh, different growth experiences. And this largely could be due to extrinsic factors, it could also be due to intrinsic, um, kind of just depends. But I can give you an example of myself uh, compared to my sister. My sister was very normal in terms of her growth development and height curve. She always fell in the average uh, when she went in. You know, we had our regular pediatric checkups growing up. But in the growth chart, she was always right in the middle. Um, and I was usually way below the growth chart, both in height and weight. I just stayed small for a really long time. I, I'm pretty sure when I was eight or nine, I still looked like I was about four or five just because I was so tiny. Um, also, to give you a perspective, when I was 12, I was still wearing um, a girl's size six, which um, girl sizing is kind of matched with age. So a size six should have been worn by a six-year-old. Um, but when I was 12, I was still like 88 pounds and I think I was four eight. So you know, like, I'm just really, 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 really tiny, um, and below growth charts pretty much my entire life, and then I don't know, finally, I started growing, but it wasn't until I was in my later teens, so probably puberty, I was a late bloomer. I don't know if anybody needed to know that, but that's kind of, um, that could be a conversation about extrinsic factors, and we'll kind of get into that with maturation. Um, 
everybody goes through it, so why not share experiences? <laughs> um, so we have to we have to consider variability. Uh, if, if you know people aren't developing at a quote unquote normal rate, right? It could be due to certain variables. Um, but understanding growth and aging is is going to be fundamental to helping individuals develop and maintain motor skills. So a lot of the individual constraints that you guys have come up with for different activities that we've worked on so far have been related to um, things like limb length, right? Or uh, sometimes strength has been a thing uh, that somewhat goes along with uh, physical growth and uh, m more along the lines of maturation. But a lot of times when you guys are saying like limb length was a could be a, a constraint or a person's height or arm length, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Those are, this is what we're talking about, okay? So um, as we go through the lifespan, right, the, the very first place we need to start is in prenatal development. So um, there are two stages of prenatal development, and prenatal stages span from fertilization all the way up to birth. So um, early development generally is going to be dependent on genetics, but there are potential extrinsic factors that can play a role. So the phases that we break this down into, and you can see on this little image to the right here, that the embryonic development phase is pretty short. Okay, so it's basically from fertilization up until about eight weeks. And from there, the rest of development we call fetal. And there's certain landmarks that kind of break down um, why we refer to these stages as we do. So let's talk about the embryonic phase first. Like I said, this is from fertilization to eight weeks. Fertilization is defined as um, when an ovum or an egg in the female reproductive system meets up with a sperm. And um, in the picture to the right, you can see um, typically fertilization happens in the fallopian tube and then that fertilized egg will travel down to the uterus and implant in the wall of the uterus. And so these little images kind of to the side show how um, cell cellular differentiation and proliferation happen very, 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 very rapidly um, in this eight week span until you get something that kind of looks like a human shape. Typically in these first weeks, you'll just have somewhat of a head shape and um, what looks like a tail. So oftentimes people say an embryo is very similar to that of uh, kind of like a tadpole, like a frog, where we have a tail and no extremity developed. But cell differentiation is really, really, really rapidly happening during this time. So that way, um, our body systems in general are, are kind of forming and the cells are differentiating based on the function that they will perform later in life. By four weeks, the heart has developed enough to beat and limbs start to form. They're kind of like nubs. By eight weeks, you generally have somewhat of a human form. And then that brings us into our fetal development, which takes up pretty much the rest of the gestational period, um, which is on average 40 weeks. So from week eight to week 40, give or take, is our fetal phase. So in this phase, it is marked by continued growth. So we have two types of growth. We have hyperplasia, which is an increase in the total number of cells. And then we also have hypertrophy, which is an increase in the relative size of an individual cell. So you guys probably have heard both of these terms in exercise physiology if you've taken that class before. In those classes, you probably talked about hyperplasia and hypertrophy in terms of muscular adaptations. But in fetal growth, we see both of these happening.
Like I said, you get differentiation of various tissues and organs, and those cells are going to continue to multiply until that particular tissue or organ has fully formed for functional capacity at birth, right, or slightly before birth if it's needed, okay? Directions of growth are going to follow generally two types of um, patterns. The first one is cephalocaudal. If we break this word down, cepha, cephalo, right, is referring to the head. Caudal refers to the tail. So that's where we get our definition, growth from head to tail. We also have growth uh, labeled as proximodistal, right? Proximo meaning towards the root of a limb and distal meaning away from the limb. So our, it, and I think this one is pretty intuitive, right? Um, your limbs are going to grow from uh, kind of your core outwards. So if you think about it uh, in terms of joints or segments, right, your shoulder and your upper arm are going to develop before your forearm and before your fingers, etc. Okay, so two, t two patterns of growth that occur. And if you think about this, it, it, it makes sense um, because our most important organ is in our head, right? It's our brain. And we need uh, those nervous connections to develop before the rest of the body, right? And es establish those connections very, very early on. So the brain is the most important organ, thus the cephalocaudal development, and then from there we get the trunk formation, which is usually why we say the embryo looks kind of like a tadpole with a tail, right? And then we get our extremity growth. So things continue to just keep developing with these patterns. As development happens in this prenatal stage, we start to see this concept of plasticity. This is the ability of tissues to assume functions of other tissues. Some of you may have heard of plasticity in terms of neural plasticity, right, where you can kind of retrain the nervous system and certain connections within the nervous system such that they are plastic, right, or um, they kind of just adapt a new form, if you will. Okay, but this is really important because if some cells become injured, right, you can have other cells be stimulated to take on the function of the damaged ones until they have been replaced. So damage or injury to cells could be for various number of reasons, but um, this is a very, very important kind of survival uh, type, or uh, not type, <laughs> it's like a survival characteristic in prenatal development, which is, I mean, it's really, really cool. Uh, we also have extrinsic factors, so pretty much every, anything kind of covering the previous slides is going to be mostly genetic, okay, but there are also extrinsic factors that I had mentioned previously, and in the fetal phase, extrinsic factors are going to have a huge role. Um, and impacting the rate of development as well as how development happens. The actual growth and, and kind of physical characteristics are going to be based on genetics, so they're kind of predetermined, right? But extrinsic factors can influence those pre-existing genetic factors. So I don't want you guys to get confused between those two. Both genetic and extrinsic factors are going to have a big role in this stage, but the genetic factors are kind of predetermined, whereas extrinsic factors hop in as time passes. So how does how do extrinsic factors play a role if baby is inside mother, right? So the mother's blood is going to deliver oxygen, right, uh, via her bloodstream, as well as nutrients through the placenta, okay? So, um, I don't know how much you guys know about babies, but the placenta is, uh, and, it, and the embryonic sac, right? They're um, kind of encasing the fetus, and they're big membranes full of capillaries and blood supplies, right? And they all kind of uh, converge 
at the umbilical cord, right, which is attached to the baby's um, belly button, right, or your, their umbilicus, okay? So the umbilical cord kind of has this network of uh, veins and arteries that merge into the placenta, which are going to have some transfer with the mother's blood. So anything that the mother consumes the baby also has a possibility of consuming. Okay, so she delivers nutrients and oxygenated blood to the fetus. And then, I mean, the fetus has organs that are creating byproducts. Okay, so in terms of carbon dioxide from cellular processes and, and cellular respiration, those are going to be taken out through the mother's blood and also excretory byproducts will also be taken out through the mother's blood which yeah you know it doesn't sound too exciting when you think about it but um maternal health and nourishment are important because of these things right so if resources are limited um where you know if, if the mother is malnourished or um Maybe she's at high altitude and has low oxygen uh, coming in her lungs because the barometric pressure outside has decreased. You know, various things to consider. But if resources are limited, the fetus and the mother end up competing for those resources, which usually it will place the fetus at risk. But sometimes fetuses are very persistent and they actually become kind of like a parasite. So you'll... You may have heard stories about mothers who ended up becoming bedridden or very sickly um, because the baby was taking up so many of their nutrients that they weren't themselves doing very well health-wise. But if mother and fetus are competing for resources and for some reason the fetus is not prioritized, right, that puts the, the baby at a higher risk for being born with low birth weight, right? So being really, really tiny and um, low in the pounds, okay? But low birth weight is is associated with a lot of different things. Um, so a baby with a, a low birth weight could have an increased risk for some disease development later in life. They could have a greater risk for infection, greater risk for death shortly after birth. A lot of things that could go wrong. This transfer also means that uh, there could be potential early exposure to toxins, right? Toxins meaning alcohol or substance abuse or viruses, okay? So if a mother gets sick from a viral infection, you know, viruses travel through the bloodstream. If for some reason they get through that placental layer, baby could also have a virus. These exposures to toxins are especially dangerous during the development of the, the central nervous system and organs, right? Because if the, that development is hindered or impaired in any way, that's kind of your setup for a human, <laughs> okay? So not good. Um, but later, that could cause impairments in physical development of the brain or other organs, as well as impairments in cognitive development and function later in life. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be limited to impairment and development as a fetus but also as a human in general and there are some some conditions or diseases that don't show up until later in the lifespan so it's kind of hard to pinpoint that they are the cause like you know prenatal exposure was the cause but um, there are associations that have been formed for different types of um, exposures to extrinsic factors and I think we're going to kind of come back to those or some examples. But first, we want to talk about genetic causes, okay, if, if we have any type of abnormal prenatal development. So genetic causes, obviously, we inherit different uh, copies of chromosomes from each parent, right? And then those chromosomes put together make up our genes and that we have certain phenotypic qualities, right, and different characteristics that we end up uh, obtaining from our parents. So genetic causes could be inherited from either parent. We have different types of congenital defects. We have dominant 
which means that we have a defective gene from one parent. Recessive means that we would have a, de a defective gene from both parents. And then also there are some times when um, in, during fetal development, a gene will mutate, um, which means that there's an alteration or deletion of genes during the egg sperm formation, okay, which is basically our fertilization process. Effects can be immediate or delayed, and they can include any of the following uh, things, right? So we could have malformations of organs, um, limbs, or other body regions. We could also have disruptions in development, either prenatally or postnatally. Other effects um, could be mental retardation or learning disabilities. Uh, some people end up having distinctive facial features if uh, these genetic causes happen in the prenatal stages. So some examples of these might be cleft palate. Um, you might have heard of that before. Um, also distance or size or distance between the eyes or size of the eyes is a very common um, abnormal developmental characteristic. And then uh, we could also have visual or hearing impairments, heart defects, it kind of just depends at what stage the, the genetics start to kind of cause this, this issue in prenatal development. External causes, like we said, um, the mother and, and baby have a, a shared blood supply. So teratogens are basically, it's the fancy word for the toxins that we talked about. So these could be drugs or chemical use, uh, drug, drug or chemical causes for uh, abnormal development. Okay, and these, like I said, are could be viruses, drugs, certain medications, chemicals. If the mother has too high or too low of levels of certain nutrients, vitamins, or hormones that contribute to growth. Again, there are more critical times of embryonic and fetal development than others. So usually when the central nervous system is developing within the first four weeks, that's kind of a critical period. Some women I do know are, are often worried because they're like, oh my god, you know, it's like that one drunken night that happens when conception happens. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, if I drank that night or if I drank any time within the first month or so, is my baby at risk for, you know, like fetal alcohol syndrome or, or something of, of the like. The important thing is, is that We've got these this cellular proliferation and differentiation happening, but I ballparking. I think I, if I can remember right, the placenta doesn't uh, fully develop until about the sixth week, which is usually when people are able to figure out if they are pregnant or not, right? And like week five or six when they have a missed period. So usually people are okay. Um, because that blood supply hasn't been shared yet, but that again is a ballpark time. So it's still it's still good. Like as soon as you, if if you're a woman, right? As soon as you find out that you're pregnant, if you are, to kind of limit your exposure to any type of teratogens. That way, you don't expose your developing baby to any types of toxins. But severity of effects are dependent on time of exposure. So if you have exposure during one of those critical periods, obviously if, if the effects might be more severe than other times. Also depends on the amount of the substance. Okay, so obviously larger amounts of a substance for prolonged periods of time, right? Or uh, it could be large sub a large amount, kind of like a, a binge exposure where you get a whole bunch at one time, or it could be prolonged periods of small amounts, um, might not be good, okay? But it also depends on the size of the substance. So smaller substances can break through that uh, placental membrane a little bit easier than larger substances can. So it kind of depends also on the chemical structure of the teratogen um, and if and how it passes through the membrane. All right, other extrinsic factors um, could be external or internal pressure on the fetus. So um, if there's like an abnormal amount of fluid inside the mother 
Um, if she falls for any reason, that pressure could be damaging. Um, extreme internal environmental temperature. Right, you kind of got to think about, um, right, you think homeostasis and our bodies maintain a homeostatic temperature. That temperature needs to be just right for fetal development to not be affected, okay, or prenatal development to not be affected. So outside environments that are at extremes, right, so if you have hypothermia, which is in an extreme cold, you could also have hyperthermia, which is uh, where you're too hot, right? Where in, in cases of like fever or uh, I know it's generally encouraged that women not take hot baths or go into jacuzzis because that increases their body temperature past what homeostasis wants us to be at. It's also why we don't encourage pregnant women to exercise too vigorously so that their body temperature doesn't raise too high. Also exposure to x-rays or gamma rays could cause abnormal prenatal development. So they usually, for the women in the class at least, if you've ever gone in to get an x-ray, uh, like at the dentist's office, or I know that the, the x-rays in those ones aren't as bad, but if you get an x-ray on a bone or something, um, or if you get any certain types of scans at the hospital, Usually they will ask you, are you pregnant? Or do you think there's a chance that you could be pregnant? Just because these the exposure to the rays is, is not good. Which is a, also another reason why they usually give you a lead blanket. Rays can get through the lead, but it's harder to penetrate. So, anyways, that's a side note. We also have uh, extrinsic factors for changes in atmospheric pressure. I think I already commented on this in terms of oxygen supply. Right, but when you go to higher altitudes, the barometric pressure decreases. And if barometric pressure decreases, that means the amount of oxygen available um, during inhalation is going to be limited. Right, so um, if you guys, again, if you've taken exercise physiology already, you'll know that um, certain types of gases in the air are um, kind of resting at certain percentages. So if barometric pressure decreases, that's why the amount of oxygen would decrease. Okay, but that could potentially induce hypoxia, which is just low oxygen availability, right? And if not enough oxygen is getting through that placental membrane, baby doesn't have oxygen, a lot of cellular processes are dependent on oxygen. So take off the oxygen supply, development stops. Also, environmental pollutants are something to consider. So usually, you kind of want to stay away from hair or nail salons that have um, those heavy chemical smells. Bleach, not good. Secondhand smoke, not good. Industrial pollutants, so like smog in the air. Living in LA, it's, it's I mean, it's hard. <laughs> Any type of pollutants in the air can also be inhaled and transferred through the bloodstream.